So it is my pleasure to introduce, to introduce Dr. Kita Subhantar, which is an associate professor in Charles American Faculty Fellow in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Central Florida, and an affiliate faculty member at the UCF's Institute for Simulation and Training. She received her PhD from the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, a bit different over the years, and an AB in psychology from Princeton University. Dr. Sudhankar has received the Air Force Young Investigator Award, a DARPA Computer Science Study Grant, and the NSF Premier Award. Uh, her research focuses on multi-agent systems and computational social models. She is the lead editor of the book Plan Activity and Integral Recognition, Theory and Practice, and currently serves on DARPA's Information Science and Technology Advisory Board. So it's our pleasure to have you there with us for the seminar. Thank you so much. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is my group's work on human behavior modeling. But for your po purposes, since I know most of the audience is from the Robotics Institute, you can view this as, let's say, a tutorial on um, how I think the, the science of understanding large-scale RAP systems. So you might ask, what exactly is a RAP system? So RAP was a term popularized in the multi-agent systems community um, circa 2002. And so the idea was that having a system that has a mixture of software agents, robots, and humans in it would prove to be a wicked coordination problem, but one that was very worth solving to be able to make headway in important domains. So this is kind of a screenshot from this original 2002 pa paper, uh, Sherry et al., where they're showing basically a scenario, a urban disaster scenario, we're seeing a human commander, we're seeing teams of, hu of, of robots in it, we're seeing software agents that are um, providing um, um, support to the, to the humans. And at that time, the belief was that what would be a difficult problem was the cooperation problem. And what should be the silver bullet to the problem was coming up with a good computational model of teamwork. And the idea is that we take this computational teamwork model, we embed it in the proxy. We take these entities, the multi the agents in the system and the robots in the system, who the authors termed as being socially autistic, and we equip them with this proxy and this would enable them to be a highly functioning member of the team. And that this is kind of the way that these systems operate. And this formalism was, you know, very successful in a lot of domains in many ways. Now looking toward now, looking toward the future, where do we stand, you know, so this is, this is a graphic that I borrowed of the world, you know, of the, of the statistics for what 2020 is going to look like. So we have a large number of connected, connected people, people connecting to the internet. Uh, we actually, we have a large number of apps that people are using, mobile phones, uh, apps, ubiquitous, that are often really serving as these personal assistant a agents for people. If you look at the Internet of Things, if you look at autonomous systems, they project 25 plus billion of these embedded uh, and intelligent systems. They may not be exactly robots, I doubt all 25 plus billion will be, but they are complex autonomous systems in some way. So looking at this future, one thing basically comes out. You have this, this number, 50 trillion gigabytes of data. So now we realize that not only do we have a coordination problem, a cooperation problem, we have an understanding problem. So our new problem in this universe, 2020, becomes how do we understand this large scale RAP system? How do we, how do we model it? How do we debug it? And so what I'm going to talk to you about, kind of the idea that I'm proposing, is the premise that the same techniques that we use to understand human social systems become more relevant to the analysis of RAP systems as humans become more complex. 
So in the Robotics Institute, there's a lot of energy devoted into making, the, making these systems that approximate humans in, in many different ways with a lot of physical tasks, but also cognitively. And as we move toward that future, this is basically going to, going to be important. So our, appro our approach for human behavior modeling, which I've kind of termed data-driven social informatics, is we collect a bunch of data on human behavior. We're, we collect data from many different types of sources. Um, sometimes we uh, use social media data, we use surveys, we use user experience, people interacting with games, people interacting with robots, people interacting with mobile apps. So we've worked with a lot of different types of data. Um, then we usually apply some amount of machine, le machine learning because the data is, is often missing things, or there are things that we have to infer from the data. And we also go back to the human source. We we look at, we use crowdsourcing. So we go back and ask humans questions to supplement the data that we already have. Our goal is to build agent-based simulations often of these complex systems. So from this um, emerges this computational social model that goes beyond these computational models of teamwork. So we're looking at not just teamwork, um, with joint intention and goals, but looking at these large-scale social systems. The current applications for this kind of work are, um, are various. So the work I'm going to talk to you about today, um, we've looked into how can we guide campus policy decisions. So I'm going to talk to you about work on parking and transportation usage, and also looking at UCF's alcohol and smoking uh, regulations. In general, we're also we're very interested in the science. How can we advance our understanding of human behavior, studying collaboration, teamwork, friendship and trust, the formation of groups and communities? Now, from a practical point of view, where do my students get hired? They get hired, you know, the same places, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Lockheed Martin, what do they care about? Often it's improved user experience, so trying to improve people's experiences with games, robots, and, mo and mobile devices. The understanding the system can help us with this experience argument. And truthfully, a lot of my students get hired for advertisement. So a lot of my students get hired for the eternal question, how can we, how can we sell the next product to the next person? So this is my group, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to present three different pieces of work that represent different thrusts in the research group, each that uses a different set of techniques, and then I'm going to come back at the end and talk a little bit about my vision for future work. So I'm going to start out presenting kind of classic data mining, where we really are just looking at the analytics piece. How can we understand this human behavior from a small amount of data in a, in a statistical way? Then I'm going to look at the problem of creating computational social models. I'm going to talk about our work in developing new normative agent architectures. And then finally, I'm going to talk about one of the most practical real-world systems that we've developed that was funded by DARPA on crowdsourcing transportation modeling on the UCF campus. UCF, like many other campuses, has an et eternal parking problem. So I'm going to talk to you about crowdsourcing parking occupancy. So to start out with, I'm going to talk about our work on machine learning in network data. This was work that was published with my student, Shi Wang, uh, in KDD, and just kind of um, a discussion of exactly what I mean. So in many machine learning problems, we treat, we, we treat each instance independently. So we have, a bunch of exam we have a bunch of examples of data, and we t treat each of them independently. What's different about, uh, about looking at, at network data is that, 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 you don't that it's not necessarily useful to make this an independence assumption. So in this case, the network data that I'm referring to refers to data um, from social media from a, from a game where the nodes usually stand for people and the edges stand for some sort of behavior. Now when we're looking at these human networks, humans self-organize. So there's a principle called homophily that often binds these systems. Nodes with similar labels are more likely to be connected. So this really helps us, if you think about it, if we want to infer something 
about other members of the network from looking at one small piece. And to make things tractable, we often make the Markov assumption. We look at uh, the, where we say the label of one node depends on that of its immediate neighbors in the, in the graph. So our relational model is built on the labels of neighbors. Predictions are made using collective inference. And basically, this formalism is very useful for doing machine learning in data sets that exhibit homophily. So what we've done is improvements on this basic relational neighbor classifier I idea. So in this, uh, this basic classifier, imagine you have a training, a training graph. So you have this graph of some type of human interactions. But your problem is you only know information about a very small number of people in the graph. So we know information about the people marked in red, that they're part of group red, and the people marked in green. What we'd like to be able to do is to find out stuff about the, pe about the people in the graph that did not provide us information. So what we do is in using a relation, the relational neighbor classifier fra framework, which is a simple, exa simple example, is we propagate these um, label, labels across the net uh, network and the predictions for a given node are solely based on the class, the class labels of its immediate neighbors. And so we can do this in this way. Now, this formalism ends up breaking down for more complicated types of social networks. So imagine you have a social system where you have nodes and they can have multiple, multiple labels. So you have a multi-label learning problem, essentially. So you're assuming that nodes may be members of multiple, multiple communities. So in this case, what happens is we have the red nodes, we have the green nodes, but the blue nodes we're saying are nodes with both labels, red and green. And then when we apply, apply these simple propagation techniques, what interestingly what seems to happen is the following. We tend to overestimate the number of nodes that have multiple labels, whereas actually the ground truth is that most of these nodes with one, with one label actually, sorry, that we've mislabeled as two labels only had the one label. So the structure of the network is informative, but the truth is that people made these social connections for one purpose, and the, the propagation mechanism is treating all of the labels equally. So my student and I were interested in looking at leveraging social context features in the network to improve this kind of propagation mechanism. So the general idea is that we can extract these social context features from the network, and we can use this in our propagation. Effectively, what the what these um, the social context feature does is it enables us to understand more about the node's community structure purely based on the on the edges. So here's how the here's how the the basic idea works. First, we take the network and we cluster the edges. We use a scalable edge clustering. Um, for, uh, formalism for doing that. So this is our this is our original network. We do the scalable edge clustering, which is a variation on k-means clustering, which works as follows. Each of these edges in the in the network is represented by a vector, all zeros and ones to mark the nodes that each edge is connected connected to. So this gives us our edge repre representations. Then what we do once we look at we build this and we cluster it, we have to pick an arbitrary number of clusters in the graph. And then what we do is we go back, and so this is our representation of the edges. This is a representation of the node. So we look at node one in this, gra in this graph, and now based on our edge clustering, we have these different types of edges. The edges with the fixed line and the edges with the dotted line. So here basically we can see that node one, when we re-represent it in social feature space, has, a, has, has three edges in group one, three edges in gr group two. So basically what we're doing is we're taking, we're using information about the propagation is now modified by the edge types that it's connected to. So you might wonder what the heck did that edge cluster looks like? That's such a like that's such a strange way to do it. And you can do other things in edge clustering for, for making these kind of groupings. You could do some kind of community detection as well. We find that edge, edge clustering ends up being scalable and fast. And so what you end up with is, is kind of 
a network here where, where we've identified these, these tight clusters of edges, and we've identified kind of interesting properties of nodes. So you can see some nodes are more in this, this kind of bridge formation where they're connected to multiple communities, and then other things are really very tight, tightly connected. So we can use this knowledge to improve our labeling of the unknown nodes. So the SCRN classifier is, is basically improves on this relational neighbor cl classifier in the following way. So our goal is to identify the probability of a specific node I having, having a label in our multi-label set conditioned on the nearest network neighbors, but also looking at, um, this, at the social features. So in addition to just having the class probability of its, of its neighbors, so taking into account the current estimate of the class probabilities, and a, the weight between the connected nodes, what we've done is we've added this social feature-based uh, term, the class propagation probability, on top of it. So the general algorithm is the following. First, we start out by constructing this node social feature space based on our training data. We initialize the class reference vectors for each class. We calculate the class propagation probability for each, each test node. And then we go through this, this iteration process where we keep estimating the test new node's class probability based on the, the, the class probability of its current na of the, its neighbors currently say. Then what we do is we update it. We update the class reference vectors. So as our guesses on various nodes changes, the class reference vectors change as well, and we recalculate. So this kind of can show a little bit of a visualization of how the process works. This is a synthetic network, a very small one with 1,000 nodes and 32 classes and 15 iterations of SCRN. So you can see it does not take that long. So we've done a number of experiments on, uh, on this kind of formalism using social features as a theoretical way that we can look at different types of problems. Um, I'll just show you a small subset of the results. So what we do is we're looking at the point as we increase the training sample size. So we start with knowing 5% of the nodes in the network and we increase. And then we compare how we can do um, with our formalism SCRN. And I should mention that this is an error metric. So we're calculating Hamming loss, which is a common, common multi-label error, error metric. And we're looking at reducing error. So we show that the use of the social features works very well here, reducing the error over WVRN, weighted value RN, which is the best performing variant of the relational neighbor classifier. And we also looked at what happens if you just use the social features by themselves. Are they awesome enough to carry the classifier in isolation without the network structure? And so this edge basically shows what happens when you train a support vector machine just using the social features alone. And so we've done some work on a, on a bunch of data sets. Um, this is DBLP and IMDB. In IMDB, our performance, we do well with the smaller training sample sizes. As it gets larger, the performance, um, the social features then begin to matter less. So eventually that there comes a point where it's not helping us. And so Kind of the take home message is that social features, this understanding of the membership of the community of the node is very valuable for these sorts of collective classification problems. And we show that we can improve on um, this weighted value relational neighbor classifier. And we've also done some experiments showing that we can, the same features can improve other kinds of problems. Um, so if you're interested, code and data sets are available here. And so I'll take a couple of questions on this before I move on to my next uh, section. Yeah. Um, so if I understand correctly, I may be wrong here, so bear with me. Um, you have this graph structure. And some of those nodes are known. And the other nodes are unknown. And you're trying to apply one of K or M labels to those nodes. Um, you're trying to, uh, it, it's a multi-label problem. So right, so it's not exclusive. Yes. So it's, where you're going over and above the typical, let's say, partially observed graph structure problem is you're trying to encode additional information between two nodes based on this, these social features, right? Like, so depending on the values of two neighboring nodes, some social feature is some weight that 
is added to the edge. It's, it's actually the social features aren't really based on the vowel. So what you said it kind of indicates that we're not looking at node. We're not looking at node level features. We're assuming that we actually do not. We don't know anything about the nodes. Um, this is often the case in a lot of social data sets, and we don't actually have the ground truth information about why people form the these these links. So what we're doing is we have a bunch of links in in, in, in the in the graph, and we're organizing them using this edge clustering, which gives us kind of tightly clustered areas, loosely clustered areas. Then what we're doing is we're saying that nodes that how a node should be labeled, it depends on kind of which groups it's connected to, and that ends up that ends up being a very um, a very important feature. So that it matters a lot whether that node was kind of in a connected part of the graph or whether it was kind of in a in a cluster. So that's that's what the social features encodes. So just a quick follow-up: um, if it was connected, for example. Um, and again, this might be naive, but couldn't the, con I mean, just the standard way where you have some condition probability tables for each node given its neighbors. In cases where it would be more connected, you just have to estimate those probabilities given more neighbors. Like, couldn't that, couldn't that? So I guess I'm a little confused when you're saying like a, a conditional probability table of, of given it, its neighbors. So usually you would, you would want to like learn this conditional probability from kind of observations of like lots of, you know, kind of earlier time slices. And we're, we're not assuming that we have that. This is actually not a dynamic graph problem. But that's a good question, yeah. So now what I'm going to do, so this is really, what I've given you is a pure analytics classical problem. It ends up being very useful as, as a way that we can improve our understanding of systems um, when we don't have much data, but it doesn't tell us more about this behavior generation process. So we've done a bunch of work in modeling and simula simulation where our goal is to go from data collected from one source and to attack some kind of modeling and simulation problem. So we've done some work in this area called normative agent architectures, and this is our paper on it that was published in AMAS. So just as a kind of a re review, when we're talking about a normative agent architecture beyond kind of a standard agent architecture that's reasoning about planning and cooperation um, in, in, in the world, the normative agent architectures are have this additional construct where they're reasoning, uh, they're reasoning about the existence of norms and normative behavior. So we're looking at we're looking at the process by which nor by which behaviors go from being a rarely observed human behavior to being a norm where they're a de facto standard of behavior across across a system but in a social norm, norm setup, we don't have kind of a law or a governing high-level rule that says this is the way the system should be. It should behave. This is a this is this is a bottom-up social social process. So work in the multi-agents community um, has has centered about this process of reasoning about norms and trying to use them um, potentially as a coordination mechanism. We think it's a very valuable one because they're very valuable for an enabling humans to coordinate and also for we think for rat these rap systems so in these in these systems we're assuming that um, so usually that there there are kind of like three types of phases that are going on uh, on the system so um, one problem that the agent faces is it's doing its own behaviors it's doing its plans how does it recognize looking at what the other agents are doing that what's occurring out there is a, is a social norm so Typically, there needs to be a recognition state where the ability, the agent needs to be able to infer the existence of norms. Then it often there's an adoption phase where it tries out different behaviors. It hasn't necessarily made a lifelong commitment that it thinks it's important, but it's in this adoption, adoption phase. So it can adopt a norm but choose to violate later. The compliance ends up being a firmer um, process by which adoption moves to belief. belief. It becomes a goal. It um, becomes part of um, the agent's priorities. And so this is kind of examples, Emil Boyd, normative KGB of architectures in this area. 
What we were particularly interested in were trying to create a, a lightweight architecture for constructing normative agents to model human social systems. So kind of the prior work in this has been looking at, at simple systems and we were interested in saying can we do a more complex system. So we were trying to build a more general purpose agent based modeling system for studying the effects of public policy decisions on our UCF campus. In this case, what we were interested in studying was UCF campus um, recently moved to a smoke-free campus. So the question is, so you know, that there, there's a lot that the university can do in terms of top-down enforcement of changing the way rules are applied. The question is, um, from a bottom-up level, how did the students feel about it? Could we model, uh, could we model this? And so to tackle this problem, we used, um, we created this, we created this normative structure. So this is a lightweight architecture. It's only really capable of reasoning about a single norm at a time. We also have other papers on, on reasoning about multiple, multiple norms. But really the only thing we're interested in is understanding how um, this agent feels about smoking. So we have this recognition, adoption, and compliance, and it's basically modeled by a single, single variable. And as the agent's um, beliefs like change that this variable may move from being a smoker to quitting smoking. And so we were interested in looking at how can we use this agent-based modeling technique to, um, to encompass kind of key, key areas that are known to be factors in why people smoke personal factors, social factors, and environmental factors. So looking first at the personal factors, um, what we did was we leaned very heavily on existing, existing literature on, on what are the personal factors that drive people in this area. So, so we did some scouting around the health, health literature and there is an extensive literature about looking at, at smoking cessation and we identified these five characteristics of people, individualism, achievement, regret, health, and hedonism, which we felt were useful for understanding the smoking problem and also something that we could get a sense of uh, based on people's answers on surveys. So individualism is looking at someone's embeddedness versus autonomy, um, achievement, mastery versus harmony. We also had kind of specific health related factors. Hedonism, how pleasure seeking an individual is, obviously plays into their, um, their thoughts on smoking. And then health, how much they care, they care about health. So effectively, these 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 traits are fixed are fixed in the agent agent model. In our model, they're seeded with um, based on survey information from from UCF students. So these are things that are fixed in the model, but other things change. So these kind of these are the kind of the two factors that in the normative literature people often come back to: the social factor. You smoke because your friends smoke. And then the second part, the environment, which is really what UCF is interested in, that's something that can be changed. So looking at what you see in terms of other people, trade, like trends of cigarettes being left around, and then other kinds of interventions that can be done at, done at UCF. So we focused our, our, our efforts on how can we kind of, how can we do, how can we model these two ideas? So our social factors model, unfortunately we did not have a good um, friendship network for the UCF campus. We built a synthetic friendship network for our model that uses common factors such as preferential attachment, link density, homophily, which I talked about earlier. Um, often um, that you get students of similar ages or, or majors that tend to cluster together. So we put all these, all these things in our model. So then the question is, how do, how do people change their mind when they, they interact with other people in their network? So, what they what happens is we've created a variation on the social learn on the social learning game for looking at this propagation of behaviors. So in the social in the social learning game, what happens is we're assuming that people every time people interact with each other, and we're assuming that everyone in the network does interact with each other periodically, that agents have the chance to play the game and receive a specific reward. Now the point is though that each reward 
that people receive is individual. It's individual and personalized. And it's personalized based on, on the factors in the model. So for instance, SS represents um, a case where you smoke and your neighbor and your neighbor smoke. So it's social validation for, for this decision. But how much it is is based on your feelings on hedonism, health, and achievement. And the prime designation is, is the complement of it. So it's basically um, 100 minus your health. So it's that if you do not value your health um, very much, then this property will be high. And so here, effectively, in our simulation, it's playing repetitive versions of the of this mini 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 game. And then at the and then at the end, we get this overall value for in the influence of friendship, which is which is calculated based on the the values of these four matrix entries. And these entries are personal personal per, per agent. So as our simulation rolls along, you have more chances of interaction. Um, you have more chances um, to to interact with people in your network. Environmental factors model things that you are physically doing in your environment. So I'll talk about this a little bit later, but we built a, um, an agent-based transportation model of the UCF campus, and we were able to repurpose this very successfully for looking at environmental factors. So we were interested, specifically UCF was interested in things like the effect of advertisements. You place advertisements around campus, um, different types of di digital and educational and promotional activities. In particular, they were interested in um, smoking cessation cessation workshops. So in our environmental model, we're assuming that instead of interacting with people in the network, you're, in, you're interacting with people in your environment, in your proximity. And, um, but people don't always pay attention to what goes on in the environment. So it's not a case where you can simply pad more stuff in the environment and make your model do what you want, because that's usually not how people respond. We wanted to maintain this idea of an intention, attention variable, which was important. And so in this, mo in this model, we introduced a simple Q learning mechanism that, that gated how much attention that people paid to uh, environmental cues. So really, two simple action choices in the model, pay, att pay attention or not, and it changed through time. So in the end, all these factors, all these, uh, these elements come together to, to, to um, unite it into our one smoking factor, uh, value, which determines the agent, agent's behavior, where these points, individualism, achievement, health, these are the personal fact, uh, factors. We have um, these being the environmental factors and this being the, so, the social factor. So, we seeded our simulation with data that we provide, got through a partnership with UCF's health services. So they had, um, so we did, first we did a survey on students' transportation usages. Then we did a surveys through the health services. So the first one was done before the smoke-free campus with, um, policy was instituted, and the second was done after the first year of this. And so what we did was we constructed a mapping between the survey questions, which we didn't have, unfortunately we didn't have any input on what the survey question should be, um, but to map to our, our kind of the personal factors that I indicated before. Um, do you think breathing smoke-free air on campus is a right? Would you feel comfortable asking someone to put out their cigarette? Ideas like that. When our agent simulation runs, um, we're interested in a couple of things. So the first point that we're interested in is, is looking at redu reduction of smoking. So how many people on campus um, will be smoking after a year? But actually, in our point of view, that wasn't the major purpose of our model, because there are a lot of smoking models out there. What was interesting to health service and what we think is interesting about the normative idea is you can look at other types of attitudes. So the one that we were most interested in measuring is looking at people's willingness to participate in these classes, and that was something the health services could, could measure. And we felt that that correlated well with being in this adoption phase, being in this mentally open uh, phase where you're, you're accepting of these new things coming in. And so I'll give you a kind of an overview of the results for um, the model. 
And so we did pretty well on, on matching, matching the smoking, but basically we were more happy that we did well in matching our, the predictions of going to class. So the gray bar shows the empirical data that was provided by the health surfaces and the blue show, shows our model. But then basically we became, so then my student who wrote his whole dissertation on this became very interested in the different elements of the model. Personal, social, environmental, these are well um, understood ideas, but you know, could we make our model simpler? Like what would be, what happens when we start changing the model in various ways? So just kind of looking, you know, in terms of simple changes that you could make by deleting part of the model. So this is, the, this is the blue line shows the complete model. Um, here what you do is you see the initial, um, the initial population, the red shows the empirical data from the actual population, and you can see the fit for our model. Our model ends up not predicting, um, they, it very quickly drops, and changes only really occur after, the, changes after this point only occur if, new po if the population changes in some way. But one interesting thing we found in our model, without the social part, we actually tend to, we actually, the social, the social part here, this bar is pretty much, it's pretty much over predicting the percentage here. And here it's kind of, here we get a case where we're under predicting. So in the gray, in the gray and the yellow, without the environmental, without the, uh, without the personal, we're under predicting. So obviously, the personal, without the hedonism factor, there there is le there is less uh, less of a motivation. But basically, with the social model, that even though people talk about social bad uh, bad effects, that they were actually um, because so many of the students on our campus already didn't smoke, that this this ends up it ends up being a case where the social effects ended up be ended up being a good thing. So we did a bunch of studies on, on this kind of model, um, but we were able, we were happy that we were able to show pretty conclusively that um, normative agent architectures can be used as, as this kind of uh, model. They're not simply good just as a coordination mechanism for multi-agent systems. You can also have the same system modem, model human behavior, and this is very important in this goal of using RAP systems. If you're interested in the more complex version of our model, check out our AAAI paper in this area. So I'll take any questions quickly about this. Yeah. Um, you have a synthetic friendship network, right? So yeah, we do. Data, you just connect to them if their likelihood of being friends was more than some. It was actually much, it was much simpler, like so the, our synthetic network did, so the main thing is that we only had kind of coarse demographic information about, about that. So we only really looked, um, we only looked at a few different fa factors. So the main driving factor in this was homophily between people in the same year and people in the same major. Other than that, we used a pretty um, simple preferential attachment type type model which gives us kind of the right degree distribution in the network but it's not it's not really a it's not it's not really a full synthetic network generation for cloning a real network because we didn't have statistics about the UCF network. If you had the real network, for example, like how sensitive is it to that? Oh, how, oh yeah, I get it. Your question is, say the network structure changed dramatically. So we changed this. Would, um, basically, how would the predictions, so what happens is changing the network structure only makes um, slight fluctuations in the, the numeric predi predictions of the model. It strongly changes which agents are affected though. So there are certain network structures that can operate very effectively as bridges and separate communities. And so it changes very much who got, got impacted and less numerically. Um, we didn't try, I mean, there are obviously very dysfunctional network topologies like the entirely disconnected network. So that would dramatically change it. But um, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to figure out how you evaluate um, these agent-based models. Yeah, so that's basically that's right. So <laughs> right. So so yes, and that that's that's absolutely true. So it is it ends up being a compli complicated model in terms of that. So the question of you know 
how you know how good is this model? Is it you know is it for instance accurately modeling rate changes and 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 element elements like that? So you know in one sense we were happy with our model because we delivered it to UCF Health Services and they were they were happy to have some kind of tool for understanding what was go, what was going on. Um, it, I don't think it's a case where um, it's definitely not a case where changing parameters makes it easy to fit the particular data source because the operations of the individual layer layers are, are complex so it's definitely not a case where adding adding more things makes it very easy to to fit that and so we did some tests about okay you know is it a good measure for the rate of change is it a good measure of this so this is, ends up not being a very good model for for rate for you know for rate of rate of change that it kind of it it tends to predict that you kind of go down to this plateau very quickly, and then when you get a new injection of students at a new semester, then it cha then it ca changes again. So I feel it's a reasonable representation of um, sometimes of social properties. It's a reasonable representation of smoking and classes and the things we put in the model. It's not a reasonable model of rate. It's not a reasonable model of addiction. So. And to some extent, as in all things, all models are bad. Some models are, you know, bad in different in different ways. So it's that's what I would say about this. Yes. Did you try different kinds of feature sets? You start off with a set of features. Oh right. So a, a set, kind of a so a set of um, personal factors. So what if we had different? No, we didn't. We didn't really because for that we we kind of leaned on the existing literature of what other other smoking models felt was important. So the set of features that we used was what the literature felt was important and what we felt we could reasonably glean from survey questions. So there are other kinds of things that you wouldn't be able to get about people's family history and and and. So on, which are more invasive to ask, and so UCF wasn't asking those kind of questions, and that would have been very useful to have, but we did not. That's one of the concerns, we're not concerned with to some of the things like whether that percentage of smokers um, was more or less an easy one to get to versus another. Oh, I, I think the percent the percent of smokers is not a difficult one to get to. I think it's the percent of people taking classes was the difficult thing to to get to. That that the 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 smoke. There are a number of ways that you could get to that the smoker answer, but most of those models don't gauge um, people's will, willingness to participate in the other kinds of things. Yeah. Okay, so I will then get in and discuss kind of the last part of the wor our work where we're really looking at embedding these systems in the real world. So this was work that was funded by DARPA on the area of crowdsourcing, and we were interested in this specific problem of crowdsourcing transportation modeling on the UCF campus. This is with my student Irfan Devami, and it was nominated for an Innovative Applications Award at AMAS. So urban simulation is a really great area for agent-based modeling because it, it's something that's measurable, it's worked well, there's been a lot of work in this area doing it. So we've, we quickly identified that for many of our projects it would be useful to build a simple transportation model of what's going on on the UCF campus. So we constructed this activity-oriented micro-simulation. We did survey data where we looked at students' habits, where they eat, what time they enter campus, um, all these vari various questions. Um, we fit distributions from them, and then we basically, when we go to initialize our agent pa population, we sample, we sample from this um, distribution. We get agents with a certain set of preferences and then we try to build um, basically mini schedules for, e for each agent. Each schedule is not done in a high degree of fidelity. So for instance, it doesn't encompass people's class schedules on campus. But it, it's kind of a reasonable um, facsimile of people entering and exiting campus and spending time in a home department. And so and then we basically can use this model. Um, and I'll show you kind of a very simplified um, kind of 
the rendering of the model that's kind of a kind of fun so here's a picture of UCF's campus it's 57,000 students um, over 12 campuses this is the main Orlando campus and so you can kind of see people moving moving around our, 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 our models some of them are on the roads um, they're depicted as people walking but uh, a bunch of them are actually driving um, so our transportation model was useful for various things so we, we had the, this agent-based model, but it really didn't do anything to help us when there were large fluctuations on campus. So if there are events and other things going on. So what we did was we looked at using mobile crowdsourcing to supplement our data. So now we have agent-based modeling, accurate but stale, plus crowdsourcing, real-time data generated by contributors of variable quality. So the data was gathered using an app built by my student Irfan called K-Park, stands for Knights Parking. It was released um, in 2014, freely available for Android and iOS. Uh, we ended up getting 1,800 students to use it uh, out of our population of 57,000. So it was, it was reasonably good. And this is, kind of, this is a, the view of the app, what the, what the students are seeing. And this kind of shows, you know, that they're getting information about which garages are empty and which garages are full, full on campus. Then we quickly realized that we, we had this, this big usage problem. We, we had a reasonable number of participants, but as other crowdsourcing people have long discovered, there are a bunch of uh, free riders in the system that are loath to make any reports. So our number of reports isn't great, and if actually we divided it by you know, the number of sections and hours, we get this very, very dismal number here. So you kind of come to a couple of conclusions. Users must be motivated to submit more reports. I'm not going to talk about our work in that area, but I will talk about our work on, on this area. The system needs to make the most of the few reports that it's got. So in this case, what we, we did is we worked at three different innovations, the agent-based model, improving the accuracy of the human information, and the quantity. And I'm really just going to talk about a couple of little tricks that we did for this thing. So the main thing that we did was we realized that it would be useful to use an algorithm portfolio for our worker quality assessment. My student started this project and he did a bake-off. There are lots of crowdsourcing systems out there, their parking system, their participatory sensor things, and we wanted to understand out of these kind of standard techniques, maximum likelihood estimation, Bayesian models, the beta reputation system, which is very popular for many systems, and these other two from the sensor um, fusion community, what would be working well in our system? So in this, we found that for at least our problem, beta reputation system often ended up being good. But we noticed an interesting point. The different methods performed well under different conditions. So depending on how much data or which areas of campus, it seemed to govern how, how things did. So we had kind of a simple idea. Use an algorithm portfolio. So rather than just you know, relying entirely on, on, on one method, let's, let's keep, keep all of them. So we had two different configurations. And so we took all those methods, and each of those methods that I showed you before is a different way of estimating worker quality. So not only are we getting the report from the user about how filled or empty a section is, but we're trying to guess about, uh, but we're trying to model that worker over time to see the quality of their, of their reports. And we also include our, in our portfolio the standard majority voting baseline. So we had two different configurations for our portfolio, um, basically a sorry the um, the cl the classification one where we decide which trust prediction method to rely on to so rely on worker quality estimates from a specific method uh, versus the regression model where we just put it all through the model and then let let the model guess. Now, one thing we were very interested in doing with this kind of crowdsourcing system, the actual user population matters a tremendous amount. So we looked before we rolled out and simulated different kind of thing, different kind of things that could happen. Did we have um, a low user adoption rate? Did we not have very many reports? And we also looked at the effects of different kind of population. So you can imagine that you could have these 
high trust workers, these high quality workers, in which case if we have high quality workers, and this chart is improvement over a majority voting baseline. So we're looking at what could we do that was above and beyond what you would do if you just took all the votes and fused them together without the estimation of worker quality. And so um, in this case, with the very trustworthy users, um, you know, it doesn't really matter that much. You see more, more, more improvement in cases where you actually have a lot of really poor, poor users. So we looked at this and we were very happy to see, so as I mentioned before, beta reputation system does better. And that we did see like some you know, improvements you know, in the portfolio area. So we were somewhat encouraged by, we were somewhat encouraged by this. And so we looked at different kinds of scenarios. We weren't sure what would happen in the rollout. Would there be a low user adoption? Would it be the users wouldn't submit them that many reports? Uh, we had kind of a standard, you know, happy scenario where we had a lot of users and reports. We had a case where we had a bunch of reports, but they were untrustworthy. So we did some kind of evaluations on this and we were encouraged by the portfolio. Uh, method, but one thing that my student realized is that that we weren't getting reports at a very good velocity. So he was he before in his initial variant of the system he was doing a batch update, and so what we realized is we could improve as well by by doing a real time information update. Um, so in this case, what we have is a system. So if you see the batch update, the black lines are the reports and kind of the yellow areas are kind of when we're modifying, we're, up, we're doing our, our updates. Now, what we wanted to move to is a thing like this, where basically when you had a report, you immediately spiked up the probability, but then it decayed, decayed over time. So we were interested in saying, you know, how could we, how could we achieve this? So we came up with an extension on the beta reputation system. I won't spend much time going through it. Kind of the intuition is we introduced this additional concept, validity. So the validity of user reports is calculated um, not just based on the user trustworthiness, but taking into account, obviously, the relative time that the report is. Um, parking occupancy is based on all reports in the time frame weighted by validity with this decay factor for the passage of time. We actually do not spend much time updating the worker quality model. We only do it if there's only relevant, if there are enough relevant reports in the um, time frame. And so with the system, we, we rolled it out. We collected a bunch of data for DARPA. And then what we did was we went back to UCF's parking services and we tried to say, you know, how are we doing against, if you look at, you know, the data that you're independently collecting. So, you know, what is, um, what is improvement? So looking at this metric, what we're doing is we're trying to improve the accuracy of our, um, parking our occupancy prediction, this is relative to the majority voting, and it's using a particular scoring technique. So we're trying to score um, misses that, pe that, that annoy the user more harshly. So we're penalizing cases where you say, the system says it's full very, strong, very strongly, and um, because that annoys the user a lot. And so we were happy to see that, yes, the, we do, you know, that we have improved um, a lot. So this is the real time, these are the portfolio methods, this is beta. So these improvements do make a definitive difference in how well that we can do the occupancy prediction. So I know that there's a lot of momentum um, here in this area and so for people who are interested in our system, the code is entirely available at, um, at GitHub and also we've put out an anonymized data set of the, the reporting because data is really very important in this domain for making, making, making progress. And so kind of the niche contributions are, you know, we've made it, we were able to make a few improvements that really helped um, the, the accuracy of the crowdsourcing. So what I've shown you now is kind of an overview of research in this area using these kind of three ideas, machine learning, agent-based modeling, crowdsourcing. And so um, we think that this is a really, really exciting area. There's a lot more work to be done in, the, in this area. And um, in particular, one thing that we've had trouble getting data from is getting data with people and devices and robots, lots and lots of robots, because it ends up being very hard to get data from these things. So we are, we're always really looking for people with interesting problems in, the, uh, problems in, the, in this area. 
we think that there, there are kind of two interesting things um, that we're interested in doing. So one thing is we're experimenting with an alternate knowledge representation for networks, multiplex, multiplex network formalisms, which we think are end up being very valuable for analyzing more complex networks that have multiple types of activity within it. Another thing that's very exciting about a RAP system versus a human social network is that humans resent it if you try to make changes to their organizational structure. They don't really like it so much if you tell them what to do. If you're looking at a RAP system, you have a system with robots, you have a system with software agents, those entities are under your control. So you can change the network structure as needed. So we're very interested in this active network control. You go in, the network is dysfunctional in some way, you can go in and change it in an adaptive way. And we think two domains that are of particular excitement are home automation systems. So looking at these interactions of few people in a smart home. You have a case where you have um, three to five people, they're in an environment with lots and lots of devices. The humans' um, preferences are very important. How they want their house heated, how they want their ho house cooled, their past, their past history. There are lots and lots of devices there. In a different type of usage case where you have more humans interacting together, we think traffic and transportation networks are a big area. I mean, already a lot of stuff with smart traffic lights, sensors, sensors on the road, users with um, mobile phone devices, and coming soon probably, probably autonomous vehicles. So we think that those are great, exciting um, areas, and we welcome ideas for collaboration. For further information on our work, I recommend two sources, um, the book that I edited on um, our activity recognition work and checking out our group website. And I'd really like to thank all the great students that I've had over the years who've contributed to the, uh, the work. So um, my nine PhD students and my current crop of students. So thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, how important is the, is the understanding of the transportation, the transportation model? Oh, very, very important because basically the agent-based model is our one vote in cases that no one voted, right? So basically, so, so the trans... If you go to like a city scale, do you start running into problems or is um, A city scale parking problem? I don't think so. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't, you're saying the, I, I don't think that that would be a problem, no. I, I mean, oh, definitely if we had a city, I would change away from our current transportation model. So yeah, so yes, I, I don't, I wouldn't advocate our activity oriented micro simulation for that, that I, no. Uh, sorry, I thought the question was about the crowdsourcing. So if we were going to a city scale, I'd go with probably a more fluid-based transportation model. Yeah, probably so. Um, I mean, it, or maybe some kind of hybrid model that models the different areas of the city in different ways. I talked a bunch to uh, Virginia Tech's group um, that did the transim model, model about this, and they, they had some suggestions about it. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker. Thank